Here we go. I need my coffee. That's important. Oh, we're gonna need this today. The Sony a7S III is finally here and it has something that people have been asking Sony for for so long, a new menu system. So in this video, what I wanna do is go through the entire menu and go through every single item and I'll show you how I set up my a7S III for hybrid photo video shooting and do some explaining of some of the features along the way. Hopefully it'll save you some time if you're setting up your own a7S III or at the very least, it might show you some features that you didn't know you had. And if there is a feature or something that I gloss over during this, feel free to head down to the comment section and ask any questions and I'll do my best to try to explain further. Okay, there's a lot to get through here, so grab a coffee, let's get into this. Okay, let's kick things off with a quick overview of the new menu system. If you're familiar at all with the old Sony menu system, there are gonna be some really big changes going on here. Our main tabs are all now on the left-hand side and we've got our My Menu tab up top. My Menu is a customizable folder system where you can choose to put different features that you wanna access quickly. This is super handy and we'll talk about how I have this set up in a little bit. Then as we move down, we've got our Shooting tab, Exposure slash Color, Focus, playback, network, and setup tabs. As we go through the menu, you'll notice little icons beside some of the options to tell us what mode that feature will affect. The photo mode icon looks like a little photo of a mountain, the video icon looks like a little film strip, and the playback icon looks like a play button. You'll notice on the shooting, exposure slash color, and focus tabs that we have those little icons in the bottom right corner, and that's because one of the new features on the a7S III is that depending on which mode you're in, you actually get a different layout for the menus. This feature is awesome because it makes it so much easier to get to the most relevant menu options quickly. Beyond the separate menus for each mode, we're also able to assign separate custom buttons for photo, video, and playback mode. And now we have function menu settings for both photo and video mode. Okay, you ready for this? Let's see how I set up my camera and what better place to start than at the very bottom in the setup tab. Page one is our area slash date page. I'm sure you can sort out choosing a language and setting up your date and time. I'm set to NTSC because I'm in North America. So I get 24, 30, 60, and 120 frames per second. If you change it over to PAL, which is the standard in Europe, you'll get 25, 50, and 100 frames per second. Page two is reset slash save settings. Setting reset will take everything back to its default or do a full camera initialize. So we are not going to do that now. And the save slash load Load settings will allow you to save your settings to an SD card to transfer to another camera if you want. Next we have the Operation Customize tab and there are some very big things happening in here. Really quickly starting all the way from the bottom we have an option to change the rotation direction of zooming for lenses that have electronic zoom rings. I never touched this. Obviously it's grayed out right now. Moving up, we have the movie record with shutter button and I always turn this on. If you're in video mode, this makes it so your shutter will start recording instead of having to use the dedicated movie button. This is gonna be important in a little bit. Then we have our screen display options for the monitor. I leave everything on except for the bottom two. And for the viewfinder, I leave all four options checked. When you're shooting, you hit up on the control wheel and it will cycle through these different views. Next is another new feature and something that I I've wanted for a really long time, the different set for still slash MV. The names in the menus aren't great. But what this does is allows you to choose which functions will stay the same when you switch between photo and video modes and which ones will change. The only one in this menu that I uncheck is white balance because generally if I've set my white balance for a location, I want that consistent regardless of whether I'm in video or photo mode. Everything else including aperture, shutter speed, ISO, exposure compensation, metering mode, picture profile, and focus mode I leave checked. This means that it'll remember those features depending on what mode that I'm in. So for example, if I'm in photo mode and I have my shutter speed set to let's say 1 60th of a second and I go over to video mode, shutter speed set to 1 50th of a second. When I go back to photo mode, it's going to remember what my shutter speed was before as well as all those other features that I had checked. This is a huge thing for hybrid video and photo shooters. 
Now, the next couple of menu options are big ones for the customization of this camera. So before we dive into them, I wanna take a second and thank Vessi for making this all happen by sponsoring this video. About six or seven months ago, I picked up my very first pair of Vessi shoes and I am absolutely obsessed with them. A lot of the photography and videography that I do means that I'm on my feet for a long period of time, walking around a lot and having a ridiculously comfy pair of shoes is so clutch. The knit top is soft and stretchy and it feels like being hugged by a cloud, or at least what I assume that would feel like. And one of the best parts about Vessi shoes is that they are 100% waterproof and weatherproof. Here in Alberta, we're coming up on the season where it's somewhere between fall and winter and there's rain and snow and back and forth between melting and freezing. And I am 100% confident that these shoes will keep me dry the entire time. They have some different styles that you can choose from. These ones are called the everydays, but I'm really digging the style of the weekends as well. And just to top it all off, they're a Canadian company, which obviously I love. I might be a little bit biased there, but that's okay. Click the link below to get Vessi's early black Black Friday sale and use the code DUNNA to get $25 off your Vessi shoes even if you miss the sale. And then I mean, your feet can be just as comfortable as mine are. So make sure to go check out Vessi and a huge thank you to them for supporting the channel. Okay, so we're still in the setup tab and we're going to go into the function menu settings. If you don't know what the function menu is, there's a little function button on the camera that brings up a menu while you're shooting so that you can quickly change certain settings without having to even go into the menu system at all. I use these kind of as secondary functions, things that I need pretty often, but not often enough to assign them to custom buttons. And like I mentioned before, if we click in to set up our function menu, we actually get two different settings, one for photo and one for video. So starting with the photo mode function menu, in the top row, I have interval shooting for shooting time lapses. Next, I have face and eye tracking. Then we have our focus mode. Then we've got our grid line display. I pretty much always leave on a rule of thirds grid, but this allows me to toggle it on and off if I want. Then we've got our focus peaking color, just in case the scene makes it hard to see our focus peaking. And then we've got our metering mode in case I wanna switch over to spot metering or something like that. In the next row, we have our prioritized recording media. This lets me quickly select which card I'm writing to. Then we've got silent mode, autofocus tracking sensitivity. I've got my grid line type, just in case I get sick of rule of thirds. Then I have my aspect ratio. Sometimes I switch over to 16 by nine if I'm shooting thumbnails for YouTube. And lastly, I have my zebra level which I don't often use in photo mode, but every once in a while. And then if we take a look at the video function menu, there are a lot of options that have the little photo icon on them. And that's because if you click to change one of the options, you can choose follow photo function menu, which keeps them the same. The ones that I have changed between the two menus are my top left is my audio input volume instead of interval shooting. And then in the bottom row, I have the S and Q frame rate instead of silent shutter. I use this to switch between quick time lapses or quick slow motion. Motion. Then I've got autofocus subject shift sensitivity, which is similar to what it was in photo mode, but this is the version for video mode. We've got autofocus transition speed instead of grid line type. And I have the gamma assist instead of aspect ratio. Gamma assist essentially allows you to put what looks like a conversion LUT on your actual camera monitor so that if you're shooting in something like S-Log or HLG, it helps you to find out what it's gonna look like after you convert it. I prefer to use zebras to do my exposure if I can, but sometimes if you're in a pinch and you need to move really fast, this is handy. So like I said, the function menus are kind of for my secondary functions that I need to get at, but not all the time. But if we move up here, we're looking at the custom key settings or what I call custom buttons. This is my front line. These are the things that I need to get at all the time. Continuing our way up the menu, we've got our playback custom buttons. So these will be functional when I'm in the playback mode to review my photos and videos. C1 on the back of the camera is set to choose which card I'm reviewing the media on, it's called Select Playback Media. C3 on the left hand side is set to rating. And when you select this option, you can also tell it which ratings you want to cycle through. I leave it as all of the one to five stars. So when I hit the button over and over, it cycles through the different rating options. The function button is set to send to smartphone so I can quickly transfer photos and videos over to my phone for instant Instagram gratification. On the top of the camera, we have the movie record button. But remember earlier how we set the shutter button to record movies? 
Now we can set this button to other things, like in this case, I have it set to rotate my media. And finally, the C2 button up top is just assigned to take on whatever function it has on the video and photo modes. Quickly skipping over video custom buttons and going to photo custom buttons, the control wheel on the back is set to ISO, the AEL button by my thumb is set to AF on, which engages autofocus and allows me to use back button focus, which I don't use often, but it's nice to have there when I need it. The AF on button is set to top between autofocus and manual focus because not all of my lenses have a dedicated switch. C1 is set to white balance. C3 I have set to silent mode, which I know is redundant since I have it in the function menu. This is actually more convenient to do it this way, but I'm so used to having it in the function menus from my other cameras, so I just put it in both. And custom button four is set to toggle on or off zebras with zebra display select. In the next bunch here, we've got the button when you press the joystick down, it's set to choose focus area. This is incredibly handy because without ever moving my thumb, I can press select the mode and then also move the spot around. The center button in the ring is set to focus magnifier so that I can punch in for manual focusing. The left side of the control wheel is set to choose the drive mode. The right side is set to ISO and it has a slightly different function than just using the ring on its own. And the down button is set to toggle focus peaking. On the top of the camera, my movie record button is set to something called my dial 1-2-3. When you choose this option, you get to then choose which of your dials change each time that you press that but right now I only have the front dial customized and when I press it once it changes over to ISO press it again it changes over to white balance and when I press it again it changes over to the audio record level and if I press it a fourth time it goes back to its normal function of being the shutter speed this is actually a pretty new feature that I just found out about so I'm still getting used to it and it might change a little bit over time but it's cool to have and the C2 button on the top is set to monitor brightness so I can switch to sunny day mode when I'm outside and the final page is just left for the focus hold for lenses that have a button on them. Now, if we back out and go to the custom buttons for movie mode, we'll see that most of it just follows the same as what the photo mode has. In fact, there are only three things that change. My C3 button on the top left allows me to switch between different steady shot modes. This is your stabilization. The left button of the control wheel is to select picture profiles. And the down button is set to toggle autofocus and manual focus. And I do this specifically because I use Sony's IR remote. And this allows me to have a button to switch between autofocus and manual focus while I'm standing away from the camera. And like I said, everything else is just set to follow exactly what's happening in photo mode. I used to try and customize this a little bit more between the two modes, but it just got more confusing than anything. Okay, so that was probably the biggest part of the customization of the actual camera itself, but there's still a lot more to get through. So quick coffee break and then we'll push on. Hopefully the rest will go a little bit quicker. Continuing with the rest of the setup page, we've got the dial customize page. The first option is the my dial settings. This is where you can set your my dial options that I just showed you. Dial setup chooses between shutter speed, which is TV and aperture, which is AV for the front and back dials. I have the shutter as the front and aperture as the back. AV TV rotate, I leave to normal, but you can also reverse the rotation direction. Dial EV comp, I just leave off because I have a dedicated exposure compensation dial. And lock operation parts, I set to all. This doesn't get used very often, but it's kind of handy. You can hold down the function button and eventually it'll just say locked on the screen. And now you can't accidentally bump your shutter speed or your aperture or your ISO. So you really can't like change the settings anymore. And then to get out of that, you just have to hold down the function button for another, it's like three seconds or so. In the next page, we have our touch operation set to on, touch sensitivity on standard, touch panel slash pad set to panel only. This disables the touch functions of the screen when you're using the electronic viewfinder. Touch pad settings don't really matter because I just turned them off. And touch function in shooting, I usually have set to touch tracking. But the nice thing is that with the updated touch screen, you can actually change that right up here. So it'll cycle through touch point, touch tracking and off. In the finder monitor page, select finder slash monitor, I have set to auto. Monitor brightness is default, but we have a custom key set up so that we can go into sunny weather. 
Viewfinder brightness is set to manual and I put it on plus one. It's a little tough to show you that because I can't record inside the viewfinder. Viewfinder color temperature I leave at zero. Viewfinder magnification stays to standard. Display quality and viewfinder frame rate are both set to high. In the next page, we've got TC slash UB display setting. I leave this on counter. On gamma display assist, we just talked about how we have that in our function menu, so we can leave that off for now. Gamma display assist type, we're gonna set to auto, so it automatically chooses the right setting for what we're using. Remain shoot display, I leave set to not displayed and auto review is set to off because I'd rather just keep shooting and check my photos later. In the power setting options, I have power save start time set to two minutes so that the camera sleeps after two minutes and then auto power off temperature is set to high. This is very important if you've ever had issues with any Sony camera overheating, you wanna make sure this is set to high and then generally you shouldn't have any trouble with overheating. Sound option, the only thing that needs to change here is that I set my audio signals to off. This is gonna be the beep that happens when it catches focus or when you start recording a video and it makes the like booty doo sound. It just gets rid of those, I don't, I don't want them. In the USB page, I have USB connection set to auto, USB LUN settings is multi, and USB power supply is set to on. This is important because now I can use a power bank to power my camera over USB-C for as long as I want, basically till I run out of space on the SD cards. For external output, I have the photo and playback resolution set to 2160p. Movie HDMI settings go a bit deeper and they change quite a bit depending on what I'm hooking up HDMI for. Record media during HDMI output I have left on, but my older a7 III, I would turn this off to keep face tracking when using an external recorder. They've now fixed that issue with the Sony a7S III, so I can just leave it on. Output resolution, I generally really forced to 2160p. 4K output select is grayed out because we have record media during HDMI output set to on, but that would be where you would choose your output frame rate if you had that turned off. This camera also has the ability to output raw video signal so you can record ProRes raw with the Atomos Ninja 5. I haven't messed with that yet, so I leave it off for now. And timecode output I have generally set to off, and the four channel audio output I leave it set to channel one and two. And in the last page of the setup tab, I leave the video light mode set to power link. That has to do with a separate light that you have to buy for it, so it doesn't matter to me. IR remote control, I leave on on because I do use the Sony IR remote control. Sensor cleaning, I do when it feels like it needs it. Auto pixel mapping, I leave on on. I haven't had to force pixel mapping yet. And lastly, in this portion, the version just lets me know if I'm up to date. Okay, we get to move on to a new tab. Super exciting, we're doing good, let's keep it rolling. Moving up to the network tab, I don't actually change a lot in here. In the first page, we've got control with smartphone for when you want to use your phone to control the camera if you're taking photos of yourself using the Imaging Edge app. Basically, I turn this on only when I'm using it. Everything else, I just leave alone unless I specifically need it. Under location information, you can actually connect this to your phone so that your phone gives it the location information is embedded in the photos, but it's all grayed out right now because I don't set up the Bluetooth to connect to my phone. Wi-Fi allows you to set up your Wi-Fi settings for the camera itself. Bluetooth, again, you can set it up so it's connected to your phone. Wired LAN, again, is where you would set that up. I leave it alone. Network option gives you airplane mode. Some people say that this helps with battery life, but generally I leave it off. Often enough, I'm sending myself photos and videos over Wi-Fi to my phone, so I need to have airplane mode off for that anyway. One thing that I do in this menu because I'm vain is I edit device name and I changed it to Dunna A7S III. You might not wanna do the same name because it'll get confusing unless you wanna give me a new A7S III and that's what you're saying. And that's okay. Everything else I just leave alone. Moving up to the playback tab. At the top, we've got select playback media. This allows us to select which slot we're playing back from, but we also set up a custom button for that. I don't touch view mode, but you can look through your files in specific ways if you want to. I leave the magnification settings at their standard position. Nothing is needed in the selection memo because we already set up our rating custom key as well, but if we wanted to change the rating system, we could do that in here. Under delete, I go to the delete confirm and I make sure that I'm selected on cancel first. So if I hit delete, 
it highlights cancel first, and then I have to go up to delete to actually delete that. Better safe than sorry, I say. I don't actually use anything on the edit page because rotate is already set up to a custom button, but you can copy files from one card to another if you want, and you can use photo capture to pull photos out of video files. And down here under the JPEG slash HEIF switch, you can decide what type of files it's pulling from the videos. I have never done this, but it's a cool feature just in case, you never know. The viewing page gives you setting options for when you're playing back time lapses shot using the interval function. I set the play speed to two and the other options are just there to launch those functions. In playback option under image index, I like to choose 25 images instead of nine. I don't often use this, but when I do, it's nice to see a bit more on the screen. Display as group, I turn to on. Anytime you use burst shooting or interval shooting, it will group the photos together so you can play them back as a time lapse, or you can open the group up and go through them individually. Display rotation, I set to auto. Focus frame display, I set to off, but it's very interesting to be able to see the focus point that the camera chose for the photo if you want. I set the image jump dial to the front dial and I changed the image jump method to 10 images. I can go one by one with the wheel on the back and then I can move faster through the images with the front dial. Oh, you still with me? It's time now to move on to the three tabs that have different options depending on whether you're in video mode or photo mode. A lot of the options in these parts are gonna be more functions that you wanna use while you're shooting, things that you might wanna change depending on the situation, and less so about things that would like set up the camera, but I'm still gonna go through them all and try and let you know about what's going on in there. Okay, starting in photo mode, starting on the focus tab. In page one, my focus mode is generally set to automatic, but it's in the function menu to change as needed. Both priority set options are set to balanced emphasis. Tracking sensitivity, I set all the way up to responsive, but we've also got this in our function menu if needed. AF illuminator, I turn to off. That's that red light on the front that helps the camera focus. I find it's just more annoying than anything. Aperture drive in autofocus, I set to standard. Autofocus with shutter, I leave on. If you wanna use back button focusing, this is what you'd wanna turn off. And pre autofocus, I turn to off. This would mean that the camera was like autofocusing all the time, kind of like in video mode. In the focus area page, I don't touch focus area here because I do that while I'm shooting with the custom button. Focus area limit, I just turn off the center fix options as well as the tracking for center fix, spot spot medium and spot large. This just removes them from the available options. So it's less for me to scroll through to get to what I want. Switch vertical and horizontal autofocus area is cool because it'll remember your specific focus area and point depending on the orientation of the camera. But I just leave it off because I find it more confusing than anything when I switch my camera and it moves the focus point on me. Focus area color, I generally leave on white instead of red. AF area registration is set to off. AF area auto Auto clear is also set to off. Autofocus continuous area display is set to on. This way I can see what it's focusing on. Phase detect area is set to off. The circulation of focus point I leave to circulate. And this is kind of cool because it allows you to jump your focus point from one side of the screen by pushing past that side. Kind of like Mario 2, if you're old enough to remember that. And the autofocus frame move amount, I leave set to standard, which allows me to make smaller movements with the joystick and larger movements I like to do by touch. But if you want your joystick to move things around faster, you can set that to large. Face and eye priority in autofocus is almost always set to on, but I have it in my function menu as well, so if I need to switch it off for whatever reason, it's just right there. Most of the time it is set to human, unless my cat needs his profile picture updated. I leave my eye selection on auto. Face and eye frame display is set to on so that I know that it's working. Face memory I have never used, but I probably should at some point register my own face with it so that it knows who I am. Someday I'll do that. Focus assistant. Autofocus magnifier in manual focus is set to off. I don't want it to automatically punch in for me. I want to do that manually. The focus magnifier option just launches 
magnified focus. Focus magnifier time I set to two seconds, but as long as you're actually touching the manual focusing, it won't go away. So it's more like two seconds after you hit your focus. The initial focus magnification is set to 2.1. I want it to actually jump in on the first click. I don't wanna to have to click twice. Autofocus in magnification mode, I leave on and I never really use it, but it is kind of neat. You can zoom in, use the focus magnification and then use autofocus in the area that you're zoomed into so it overrides your other focus point. You're gonna wanna use back button focus to accomplish this though. Under peaking display, I have it set to on, high, and red. Now, if we flip over to video mode, focus mode is always set to continuous autofocus and I use my custom button to switch into manual. Autofocus transition speed and sensitivity I have in my function menu, so I change them as I need from there. But more often than not, they're set to three out of seven for the transition speed which is just a bit slower than the standard. And I have three out of five for the autofocus subject shift sensitivity most of the time, which is definitely slower than the default. Basically the sensitivity is how fast it'll choose a new autofocus subject. So fast is really good for moving subjects or if you've got multiple subjects and you wanna be switching between. And slow is when you know you're gonna be staying on one subject who's not moving around much. Then the transition speed is how quickly it pulls focus from one subject to another. One is really slow and smooth and seven is snappy and fast. I find three to be kind of pleasing and smooth generally. The next two pages are actually shared between photo and video mode, so we've actually gone through them already. In the focus assistant, I changed the initial focus magnifier to four times. I'm really not sure why they're different between photo and video mode, but that's the option that I have. And all of the peaking settings, again, are the same between photo and video mode, as you can see by the little icon there. All right, next tab, let's switch it back to photo mode and we're gonna be moving into the exposure tab. So in exposure slash color, we've got our ISO and ISO range limit and I don't touch either of these because I can set that while I'm shooting. ISO auto minimum shutter speed, I just leave set on standard for those rare times that I'm shooting in aperture priority. It's grayed out right now because I'm in manual mode. Exposure compensation, I have a dedicated dial for so I don't touch that. Reset EV compensation, I just leave on reset but it doesn't matter unless you're setting your exposure compensation from the menu instead of the dial. Exposure step, I make sure to set it to 0.3 EV, AKA one third of a stop increments. So I have more control instead of the half stop increments. And I don't touch the exposure standard adjust, but if you wanted to mess with the overall exposure standard, you could dive in there. There's a little warning that it gives you that tells you it's probably not a good idea, but you know what, you're your own person. You do you. In metering, I generally leave the metering mode to multi, but sometimes I use spot or highlight, but I have this in the function menu, so I don't need to go into the menu for it. Face priority in multi is set to on. Spot metering point, I set to focus point link rather than center. And the AEL with shutter, I leave set to on so that I'm in control. And if you're clever with your back button focusing and your shutter, you can actually do some really interesting things with this. For the flash menu, I don't shoot any flash, so I just don't touch any any of that. White balance I set with a custom button. Priority set auto white balance. I usually just leave to standard and shutter auto white balance lock I set to off. In the color and tone page, I set the dynamic range optimizer to off. My creative look is set to standard and my picture profile is off when I'm in photo mode, but we're gonna talk about my picture profiles for video in a little bit. Zebra display and zebra level are something that I change in custom keys and in the function menu. I don't generally use them in photo mode. If zebras are something that you don't know how to use for exposure, that's probably for another video, but definitely really cool. Flipping over now to video mode in the same tab. In the exposure page, I set auto slow shutter to off. ISO and ISO range limit, again, I actually set while I'm shooting. And the auto manual switch settings only work in full auto mode, so I guess I just don't get to use those. Nothing changes in the exposure compensation or metering pages from what we saw in the photo mode. In white balance, we have the shockless auto white balance feature, which I set to two. This smooths out the white balance transitions if you're in auto white balance mode, but I rarely use auto white balance in video anyway. Nothing changes in the color slash tone or zebra display pages from the photo mode settings. Can you see the light at the end of the tunnel? Flipping over to photo mode one more time. 
and we're heading into the shooting tab. Under image quality, we've now got the ability to choose between JPEG and HEIF files. I haven't experimented with HEIF files yet, so I'm just leaving it on JPEG, but it doesn't really matter because under file format, I choose raw. So I'm not using JPEGs or HEIF files at all. Raw file type is set to uncompressed. JPEG quality, which again, does not matter at all, is set to extra fine. JPEG image size is set to 12 megapixels. Aspect ratio is generally set to three by two, but like I said before, every once in a while I switch over to 16 by nine if I'm shooting thumbnails. Again, I'm shooting raw, so even if I shoot in 16 by nine, I can still uncrop that. Movie file format will set once we get to the movie mode. Movie settings, again, will set once we get to movie mode. APS-C mode, I just leave on auto. Long exposure noise reduction, I set to off. The only time I might turn this on is if I'm shooting long exposures that are over like two minutes long. There are some interesting videos on YouTube kind of explaining this, so I'll leave you to do your research. High ISO noise reduction and HLG still image are grayed out when I'm in raw mode. Color space is set to sRGB. Lens compensation, I just leave them all on auto. In media, we're gonna skip over format because I do not currently want to format my cards. In record media settings, prioritize record media sets which which slot you're going to record to first. In this one, I have slot one. Recording mode is currently set to simultaneous, so it's recording the same thing on both, but sometimes I will use standard, which will go from one to the other. So when it runs out of space on the first one, it'll go into the other one. And then I want to set auto switch media to on. Recover image database and display media info are functions that I have never needed to use, but they pretty much do what they say they do. In the file menu, we have file slash folder settings. I leave my file number set to series, file set name I set to A7S, and folder name I leave on standard form as opposed to date form. Select record folders only works if you have multiple folders made, which you can create by clicking create new folder, and I leave the rest of these absolutely alone. Under shooting modes is where you can set your custom memory modes. You have three of them on the mode dial, but you can also set more on your card if you want by using these M1, M2, M3, and M4. I don't ever use these. My understanding is that when you format your card, these go away anyway, and generally three custom function modes is just fine. Memory recall media slot one is saying that's where it's going to save those extra memory modes. Register custom shoot set, you can assign specific settings to a custom button, but I don't ever use this. Drive mode is all stuff I choose as I'm shooting. This is your timer, burst mode, and such like that. Bracket settings you can set up if you're doing a lot of bracket shooting. It's handy to be able to choose the self timer, but again, this is stuff that you'll wanna set up as you're shooting them. And interval shooting function is where you can set up for shooting time lapses. This is gonna be a little bit different every time I shoot a time lapse. In the shutter slash silent page, we've got silent mode settings and we've got a custom button to enable silent mode. Shutter type, I leave on mechanical shutter. Electronic front curtain shutter, I set as on generally. Release without lens and release without card, I leave on enable. Anti-flicker shoot is set to off. I've tested it a little bit and it didn't seem to make much of a difference, so I just don't trust having something on if I don't know exactly what it's trying to do. For image stabilization, I leave steady shot set to on and steady shot adjust set to auto. Continuing down, we have zoom, but we'll come back to that in video mode. And then shooting display, we have our options for grid lines, which most of the time I leave on, and I've got the rule of thirds grid. In live view display set, I've got setting effect on, exposure set and flash, and frame rate low limit set off. These are all just the default settings there. All right, switching back over to video mode for our shooting tab and back up to the top. We have image quality under file format. I typically shoot one of two ways. Most of the time it's XAVC-S 4K, which is a long GOP compressed file. And the other one that I use only sometimes is an XAVC-SI 4K, which is easier on the computer, but much larger file sizes because it's an all intra compression. I find the quality of XAVC-S to be great and my computer seems to handle it just fine. I haven't been using the new XAVC-HS 4K, 4K because there have been some reports of computers really struggling with it and not being compatible yet. So I'm just gonna wait until it's a little more widely accepted. 
Under movie settings, I change frame rates a lot, but the majority of the stuff that I shoot is in 24 frames per second. And the record settings are at the highest available 10-bit 422 option. In this case, it's 100 megabits per second, but in the other frame rates, it's actually higher. So if we switch this over to 120, you're gonna see that now it's 280 megabits per second. S and Q settings are going to change depending on what I'm shooting, but it'll often be one frame per second sped up to 24 frames per second for time lapses, or 120 frames per second slowed down to 24 frames per second for quick slow-mo. And for the record setting, I choose the same as my other option. I don't mess with proxies much, but if you find you're having trouble with your computer reading files nicely, this would be a good option for you. APS-C shooting isn't available in 4K on this camera, and lens composition is the same as what it was in photo mode. The media page is the same as it was in photo mode and under file I do go in and customize the name again to A7S 3 Under shooting mode I am almost always in manual exposure mode and S and Q is the same when I have that. Right now it's grayed out because we're not in S and Q mode. Exposure control type is really interesting. If you switch it, it goes into a flexible auto mode where you can temporarily toggle aperture and shutter speed into manual mode by using custom buttons. I just leave it on this PASM mode because that's what I'm used to. We got a couple of familiar options here that don't change from photo mode. Under shutter slash silent, nothing changes from photo mode as well. Audio recording is set to on and the level is set in the function menu or with the my dial shortcut. Audio out timing is set to live. Wind noise reduction is set to off. I don't have any accessories that use the multi-interface shoe so we don't set this up. And audio level display is set to on so that I can see my levels while I'm recording. Time code options I don't really change because I don't really use time code. Image stabilization is a bit different in video mode and generally I leave it in standard mode. But if I want a little bit of extra stabilization straight out of camera, Camera, I'll change that over to active. And if I want to use software to do some really heavy stabilization, I'll turn it to off because then I can use gyro data from the camera to stabilize it afterwards. And steady shot adjust stays as it is from the photo menu. Zoom actually becomes useful in video mode, but this first option actually just launches the zoom. So we don't wanna to touch that right now. We wanna change our zoom range from optical only zoom to clear image zoom. Clear image zoom punches in a little bit on the picture without losing too much quality. You can set the zoom speed for both standby and recording so that you can do smooth zooms. I just set them both to three and then you have the same options with the remote. Again, I just set them both to three. Under shooting display, we've got a couple of things that come over from photo mode and then we've got EMPF DISP DER REC. Sony, these names. But this is a really great new addition where when you're recording a video, it adds a red box around the monitor as a tally light so that you know you're rolling. I definitely turn this on always, so handy. And finally, under marker display, I don't use this often, but I just have the center marker turned to on and then I toggle on and off the marker display as I need it. <sighs> We did it. And now there are just three more things that we need to talk about. Customizing the My Menu pages, how I use my memory recall modes, and everybody's favorite topic, picture profiles. Starting with My Menu. I use My Menu as kind of like my third point of access. So custom buttons are number one, function menu is number two, and then My Menu is either things that I can't put on custom buttons or in the function menu, or things that like I use sometimes. If you have your My Menu set up really well, you will rarely ever have to go digging through the menus for anything. First things first, if you go down to the bottom where it says My Menu Setting, this is where you can add an item, sort items, delete items, delete a whole page or delete everything and start from scratch. And at the very bottom, you can choose Display from My Menu. Then when you hit the Menu button, it'll automatically come up into My Menu. I turn this off because I find it's easy enough already to get to the My Menu from the touch screen. Right now, I have three pages in here. Page one consists of video file format, movie settings, s and settings, mark display, exposure mode, and interval shooting function. Very loosely, this is kind of like a video settings folder. Page two has camera settings memory so that I can update the custom modes on my mode dial. It gives me quick access to change custom keys in all of the different modes. It has my function menu settings, and then it also allows me to format my memory card. I specifically put this down at the bottom because I was scared of accidentally hitting it. Page three has the control with smartphone function, and then 
all of my HDMI options. Okay, on to everybody's favorite topic, picture profiles. This got a lot simpler for me when the a7 III came out and it had 10-bit on it. Basically, most of the time I'm using picture profile 8, S-Log3, S-Gamut3, Cine. It's the default picture profile 8. That's what I like to use. Every once in a while, if I'm trying to match with my a7 III, I will use picture profile 7, S-Log2, but I'll change it over to S-Gamut3 Cine. And then there is just one other picture profile that I use that's kind of a custom one. I call it kind of my straight out of camera one, and I'm always playing with it a little bit, but right now it's HLG3 in Rec 709, and then my black level set to minus five and saturation set to plus five. I find that it's a little less contrasty and saturated than no picture profile, but it still looks pretty good straight at a camera. And I can use this to send straight to my phone and post right to Instagram without having to do any editing or color grade. And lastly, we have the mode dial on top. There are three different custom modes on there, but here's how I use the whole mode dial. When I'm shooting photos, I'm mostly using manual mode. And the only thing of note there is that my picture profiles are off when I'm in this mode. When we switch to the video mode, this is where I shoot most of my 4K 24 frames per second footage. This is kind of my main video setting. And so all the movie settings are what we talked about before. So we've got 24 frames per second, 4K, 10-bit, 422, XAVCS. And the picture profile defaults to S-Log3 here. I pretty much leave it on S-Log3 all the time. Switching over to S and Q, I primarily use this for time lapses. Like I said before, it's going to be one frame per second sped up to 24 frames per second. It's nice just to make a quick time lapse here and there. Then we get into our custom memory modes. Memory Recall 1 is actually the same settings as my main video mode, except that I changed it over to 60 frames per second. The shutter defaults to 1 1 25th. White balance is set to 5600 Kelvin. The aperture defaults to F1.8 and ISO ISO defaults to 640, which is the base ISO for S-Log3. Memory Recall 2 is exactly the same, except it's 120 frames per second, and the shutter changes over to 1 250th of a second. Memory Recall 3 is a little bit different. It's a custom mode that I specifically created so that I could transfer video files over to my phone to post without having to color grade or edit or anything like that. So what I needed here was a good looking file with small file sizes, and it needed to be transferred over Wi-Fi and there are certain modes in here that just aren't. So this is set to XAVC HS 4K, 24 frames per second, and under the record setting, it's 30 megabits per second, so a nice small file size, and it's 420 10-bit. My phone couldn't read any of the 422 files, and I also couldn't send them over Wi-Fi. And the picture profile is that picture profile 10 that we talked about before, my custom HLG3. And the ISO defaults to 100 because that's the base ISO for HLG3. And that's it, we did it. We made it through every single page, every single menu function, Wow, it, there, there's a lot in there. <laughs> now, just so it said, if you dive more into the custom button functions, there are some things that we didn't talk about, things that I don't necessarily use, but there are more options in there. We probably aren't missing many because we did talk about a lot, but there are some things that are like custom button only functions that you could probably find in there. Everything that we talked about is just the way that I like to set up my camera that I find makes my work as efficient and effective as possible. Possible. If you made it this far, you probably need another coffee just as bad as I do. Thank you so much for sticking around and I do encourage you to head down to the comment section. Let me know what you thought of this whole thing. If there's something maybe you would do a little bit differently. I love hearing that kind of stuff. And on your way down there, make sure to hit the like and subscribe button. Hit that bell notification so you know when I post new videos. Thank you so much to Vessi for making this happen and sponsoring the video. Thank you for watching and I'll see you next time.